What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about venous thromboembolism. That includes DVTs and PEs. Let's begin our discussion talking about the pathophysiology of DVTs or deep vein thromboses. So when we talk about this, the pathophysiology is obviously there is a clot, a thrombus that develops within the veins. And what veins? Well, usually it's the veins of the legs that are most commonly affected. Let's pretend that we have a very simple diagram here of the inferior vena cava. And then down here, we go into the iliac veins. What if you had a little clot in that area? That could be an iliac DVT. If we go down a little bit further and we got the femoral vein, what if I got a clot in there? That could be a femoral DVT. I get down to the popliteal vein, that could be a popliteal DVT. I get down to the peroneal veins, that could be a peroneal DVT. Oftentimes we make this a lot simpler and we say that anything that's usually above this bifurcation, so popliteal femoral iliac, that's more of what's called a proximal DVT, and then if it's below that, it's called a distal DVT. Because that's really important to remember. Same thing, tibial veins, if you get a clot there, a tibial DVT. So tibial and peroneal are more distal DVTs, femoral, popliteal, and iliac are more of the proximal DVTs. So the question is, what in the heck is causing these veins to become thrombotic? And really this comes back to that concept of Verco's triad. So Verco's triad says that if there's stasis of blood flow, there's hypercoagulability or endothelial injury, you can increase the risk of a clot. Let's go through each one of those. Stasis, what is this? This is usually where there's increased amount of time for the platelets to bind with the endothelium and lead to a clot. So what are some things that can cause stasis? It's pretty straightforward, right? Post-op states where patients are kind of bedridden for a bit. Paralysis where they can't move and therefore that's another reason. Or really, really long travel, greater than eight hours at least in a plane or car. Look for that in the clinical vignettes. That's a big one. The other one is that there's destruction of the endothelium. The endothelium is normally supposed to release things like nitric oxide, prostacyclin, that blocks platelets from binding. But if you have endothelial injury, now the platelets can just stick right away. So what are some things that basically does that? Well, it could be things like smoking. That's a really big risk factor. Surgical procedures. But the biggest one I really want you to watch out for is if they have venous catheters, especially like femoral central venous catheters. That can definitely cause this. The other one is hypercoagulability. This is basically where you have an increase in the number of procoagulants, things that want to cause clotting, and a decrease in the number of anticoagulants, the things that want to prevent clotting. And that's the concept here. So what are some of these things that can cause this? Well, let's talk about it. You know, patients who develop malignancy like in pancreatic cancer or in lung cancer, they can increase the amount of procoagulants, which will then lead to a clot formation. Other scenarios would be if they have uh, situations of pregnancy or they're on oral contraceptives, please don't forget that one, it definitely can increase their procoagulant production. Another one is if they have mutations, particularly something like factor V Leiden or prothrombin gene mutations, this can also increase the amount of procoagulants that they form. When there's decreased anticoagulants, that's the same fact, you have less of these things to prevent clotting. Usually there's less protein C, less protein S, less antithrombin 3. What if I pee a bunch of them out like in nephrotic syndrome? That could also cause this. Another one is if they have antiphospholipid syndrome. Usually this is a patient who has an underlying history of lupus, but they have these antibodies called anti-cardiolipin antibodies that lead to the decreased production of these different types of anticoagulants. So that's another one. So look for patients with SLE and positive anticardiolipin antibodies. Another one is they're on heparin. And patients who take heparin, this may seem super paradoxical, when they take heparin, some patients develop a reaction to the heparin, and they produce particular molecules like platelet factor 4s and these different types of antibodies that bind onto the heparin. And then what happens is this leads to clots that are forming all over the place that consume a lot of your platelets and some of your clotting proteins, and then the patients also bleed. So this is another really big thing to watch out for is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, with that being said, we have an understanding of the reasons why the patients may form clots in their veins, whether it's the proximal or distal veins causing DVTs. But the question then leads to what is the ways that these patients will present if they have a clot in their veins? Well, you're preventing venous flow. And so it backs up and it causes a lot of pain and swelling of the leg. And sometimes if you do this special test where you try to have them dorsiflex, you try to push that, it'll cause a lot of pain. It's called a positive Homan sign. You should be careful with that because it can't actually break the clot off and lead to a PE. But these are the big things to remember here for DVT. All right. 
So why is a DVT so bad? What's scary about it? Well, there's a couple things. One is it can cause a lot of congestion of blood. So if you can't move blood, especially with a really proximal DVT, like an iliofemoral one, that's really, really proximal. The blood will back up and it'll cause the limb to become super congested and become a bluish limb appearing. And so we call that phlegmasia cerulea dolens. Sometimes if the congestion is so bad, it can actually cause compression of the nearby artery, which reduces blood flow to the actual limb. And you'll start getting a white pale limb, which we call phlegmasia alba, right, dolens. And so think about al albinos, right? The next thing is that sometimes after they have the clot, and then they actually maybe they, they, they get put on anticoagulants and the clot dissolves. Sometimes the actual vessels have this thing called a post thrombotic syndrome. And that's usually where the veins are just not very good at being able to move blood properly. And they can develop peripheral vascular disease or chronic venous insufficiency as a result. The last and probably the scariest complication of a DVT is if that clot pops all the way up, goes up into the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and gets stuck there and causes a pulmonary embolism. This can lead to decreased blood flow to the lungs, which can lead to pulmonary failure, and it can also have less blood leaving the heart, which can lead to heart failure and potentially put a patient into shock. So how do we diagnose a DVT? Well, if a patient comes in and they have leg swelling, edema, a positive Homan sign, they have history that suggests that they would have some of the Virco's triad features, stasis of blood flow, hypercoagulability, or some type of endothelial injury, then you should go ahead and consider that. And ways that we do that is we look at the Wells score and it says, okay, do they have any previous DVT? Because that puts them at a high risk. Active cancer, hypercoagulability, recent embolization or a bedridden, stasis, localized tenderness along the venous distribution that again suggests more of a DVT, leg swelling suggests DVT, asymmetric calf swelling, pitting edema, collateral superficial non-varicose veins, and an alternative diagnosis, you subtract points away. So based upon this, you'll kind of gather up all your points and say, which one did this patient have? If you do this, and you generate a very low score, like I'm talking like you know, less than one, or maybe even you get a couple, like you get like score of one to two. This means your pretest probability is like, it's really low. So there's not a guarantee that this patient has a DVT, but you're pretty, you're, I'd say you're pretty confident that it's a low likelihood of DVT. What you can do is you can obtain a D-dimer. This is a molecule that's basically indicative of maybe potential clots that are forming. It's not super specific though, but it may be somewhat helpful. If the D-dimer is really low, you can say with a decent amount of con confidence that the DVT is not likely there and you can exclude the diagnosis. If it's greater than 500 though, then you can't necessarily exclude the diagnosis. So you may have to move on to the next step, which is to obtain an ultrasound of that actual area that appears to be swollen or look rule out a DVT in the iliac, femoral, tibial, popliteal area. The other thing is if your score is greater than two, so they have a score that is at least greater than two, then you can say, okay, I got a high probability that I have a DVT. I'm not even gonna waste time on a D-dimer. I'm going straight to getting an ultrasound. So low probability, moderate probability, obtain D-dimer. If it's positive and it's elevated, go to get an ultrasound. If it's a high probability, don't waste your time with a D-dimer, just go right to an ultrasound. From there, if the ultrasound shows that they have a DVT, boom, the diagnosis is confirmed. You got a DVT and you find out where it is. Is it proximal or distal? If it's negative, then again, you've ruled out the DVT. And so this is the way that I would want you guys to remember about going about diagnosing a DVT. Use the Wells criteria. Don't go crazy in memorizing this. Try to understand the actual pathophysiology of how DVTs form and the presentation of DVTs, and you'll be pretty good to go here. But again, if they were to do this, they would give you these scoring systems and help you to determine what's the next step. Give me a D-dimer or give me an ultrasound. All right, how do we treat a DVT? It's actually pretty straightforward. If it's a massive proximal DVT where the patient has that findings of phlegmasia cerulea dolens or albodolens, you gotta get on this, man, because these are super high risk uh, kind of DVTs. And you should do a thrombectomy. Sometimes you can consider a little bit of um, intra arterial TP or intravenous TPA to go into the area like catheter directed. So you take a catheter, you go into that area of the vein and you squirt a little TPA in there. But generally like a thrombectomy would be preferred. If it's a proximal DVT without findings of phlegmasia cerulea dolens, then oftentimes it's just anticoagulating. But if they have a contraindication to anticoagulation, then you might have to do an IVC filter. And then lastly, if it's a distal DVT, 
you want to then consider, do I really need to anticoagulate these patients? You can, but some you can just observe and you can repeat it with an ultrasound and see if the actual DVT has gotten bigger. There is these like small criteria. I don't want you guys to go too crazy with it, but a distal DVT, you could consider anticoagulating or you could observe it with a repeat ultrasound and see if it gets bigger and extends into one of those proximal veins, then I would anticoagulate the patient. All right. I think one of the biggest things to remember is that you want to figure out why the patient has the DVT because you can put them on anticoagulation, you can do a thrombectomy, you could serial ultrasound them, but you want to figure out what was the reason they developed a DVT and try to prevent that from occurring another DVT. All right, we move into the next component here, which is when that DVT, that clot breaks off, moves up and gets stuck in one of the pulmonary arteries. Now we have a pulmonary embolism. So when a pulmonary embolus forms, there is many different causes. And the way that you can remember this is the mnemonic fatal, fat embolus, air embolus, thrombus, like a DVT, amniotic embolus, or less common, the septic emboli. So again, that's going to be the big things to remember here. The classic way that these patients will present is they may have pleuritic chest pain, they may have dyspnea, they may have hemoptysis. But again, remember this mnemonic. It's fatal. Fat embolus, air embolus, thrombus, amniotic, and less common. Out of all of these, the DVT is by far going to be the most common cause of a PE. Okay, fat embolus would be if you have a big old like long bone fracture. Air embolus is if you're performing some type of procedure like a central venous line and you end up actually getting a little bit too much air that gets kind of shot into the veins. Amniotic embolus could be during the actual birthing process. And if a patient has a history of infective endocarditis that's affecting the tricuspid valve, that could also break off and block the actual blood flow. But these are the big things here to remember, okay? Oftentimes, I would say that the most common finding that these patients have of a pulmonary artery embolus is usually dyspnea. Um, so that's the big one to remember. I can't honestly say I've ever seen a patient with hemoptysis or pleuritic chest pain. Dyspnea definitely is going to be one of the most common findings. All right. With that being said, if a patient has a pulmonary embolism, why are these things so bad and so terrifying? I'd say one of the biggest things is respiratory failure. Think about it. You have a block of blood flow from the pulmonary artery to the lungs. You can't perform gas exchange. You're going to have a poor perfusion. And therefore, you're going to have a normal ventilation or increased ventilation. So because of that, there is a VQ mismatch that will lead to hypoxemia. So again, normal ventilation, poor perfusion, you get a VQ mismatch, hypoxemia. The patient and a result of the hypoxemia can develop an increase in their heart rate. This is one of the classic findings is a patient who has dyspnea, hypoxemia, tachycardia, and maybe they're working a little bit harder to breathe. They're tachypnic, they're dyspnic, and that is really big signs to look for. So if a patient comes in, they have signs of dyspnea, they're working a little bit harder to breathe, their respiration rate is increased, they have a low O2 saturation, and they have a sinus tachycardia with a recent diagnosis of a DVT, you better be thinking about a pulmonary embolism that's causing respiratory failure, okay? <clears throat> the other thing that's probably the most terrifying thing is obstructive shock. If you have a really large saddle embolus that's blocking blood flow, I'm going to have almost no good blood flow leaving the right ventricle. The resistance to blood flow is going to be so high. Because of that, my right ventricular afterload is going to be really high. I'm not going to be able to get blood out of my right ventricle. So it'll start to fail and it'll dilate. When it dilates and it fails to get blood flow moving forward, blood will back up and they'll develop jugular venous distension. On top of that, their RV will dilate and it'll start shifting things from the right to the left. If I do that, I reduce my amount of blood flow that can come into the left ventricle because I'm shifting the septum. And that'll reduce the cardiac output, that'll cause the patient to have a rebound tachycardia, hypotension, and sometimes they can even go into shock. I've seen a lot of patients just go into PEA arrest from a massive saddle embolus. So I think some of the biggest things to watch out for if a patient has a pulmonary embolus is to watch out for sinus tachycardia, tachypnea, complaints of dyspnea, hypoxemia, and then watch out for hypotension. These are the big things that you really want to watch out for. All right, how do we approach a pulmonary embolism? If a patient comes in, they have dyspnea, they have tachycardia, they have work of breathing, they have hypoxemia, they have hypotension with some of these findings and a history of a DVT, I'm gonna get it first a chest X-ray and an ECG. This may sound dumb, because you're like, how am I gonna be able to diagnose a pulmonary embolism off of this? Anytime a patient has dyspnea or any kind of chest pain or they have any hypoxemia, you should always get these tests. 
A chest x-ray can at least rule out other things like pneumonia or pulmonary edema, etc. So usually it's normal. That's one of the biggest things that you want to remember is a chest x-ray is usually completely normal. The EKG is actually somewhat helpful for your boards. Um, not helpful in true real life though, but you're going to find a couple things. One of the things that they like to say is the S1, Q3, T3. This is usually a sign of right heart strain. So if you look for a right bundle branch block, right axis deviation, and you see a Q wave in lead one, you see inverted T waves in lead three, and you also, again, see this potential right bundle branch block. These are usually potential signs that a patient may be having right heart strain. So again, S waves and lead one, Q waves and lead three, inverted T waves and lead three, and a right bundle branch block. And if they also have right axis deviation, you, which they do also have right axis deviation here, where their uh, Q, their S wave is really deep in lead one, and then they have a big R wave in lead three. This is definitely right axis deviation, right bundle branch block, S1, Q3, T3, all signs of right heart strain, because you can't get blood out of the right heart into the pulmonary artery because of the embolus. But by far, the most common finding is usually sinus tachycardia. If you get lucky, you may see the S1, Q3, T3. By far, the most common finding is sinus tachycardia. All right, from here, if you have a normal chest X-ray, an ECG that suggests right heart strain or sinus tachycardia, think about what's the chances that they have a pulmonary embolism. So you do that Wells criteria scoring. Do they have any features of DVT? Is there another diagnosis that makes this potentially you know, a- another alternative? Is their heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute? Do they have sinus tachycardia potentially? Have they had any immobilization or recent surgery that increased their risk of that Verco's triad? Do they have a history of DVTPE? Do they have hemoptysis? Do they have malignancy? These are all things, again, I want you to think about where malignancy is suggestive of a hypercoagulable condition, immobilization is consistent with stasis, hemoptysis could be a potential complication, tachycardia is a potential sign that there is hypotension or respiratory failure, and then again, features of a DVT, history of a DVTPE. If you do this and you get your score and it shows that it's less than two, it's low, low, low risk. So I want to go even a little bit further and really make sure that I don't miss a pulmonary embolism. So if I do my well score and it's less than two, I'm going to do another score that really will help me to rule out a pulmonary embolism. This is called a PERC score, a pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. And it just looks at their age, their heart rate, their saturation, if they have any hemoptysis, prior PE, DVT, leg swelling, recent surgery, trauma, or estrogen use. If there is not one point that I get out of that, it's not a PE. But if there is at least one point, at least one or greater, I cannot safely send that patient home with confidence that they do not have a PE. So if their PERC score is greater than or equal to one, or they have a moderate probability, so a score of greater than two, at least two to six, from here, I'm going to get a D-dimer because again, it's indicative of maybe that there's a lot of clot burden. If the D-dimer is less than 500, I can pretty much confidence say, okay, it's unlikely to be a a, a PE or DVT. If the uh, D-dimer is greater than 500, that's a decent amount. And that's relatively concerning. And I can't with good strength and good kind of like cognitive like power say I can send this home patient without, send this patient home without ruling out a a PE. So then from there, I will move to the next test. And that's going to be a CT pulmonary angiogram or a VQ scan. I would also order this test if they have a very high probability. So high probability of a PE, you go right to the best test, <clears throat> CTPA versus a VQ scan. Moderate probability, D-dimer. If they have a very low probability, use the PERC score. If the PERC score is zero, it's occluded. If it's greater than or equal to one, D-dimer. If D-dimer is greater than 500, CTPA or VQ scan. Now, which one would I actually get here? The CT pulmonary angiogram or the VQ scan? It depends upon the patient. Do they have some type of contrast allergy or a very terrible kidney disease? Are they pregnant? And these, um, oh, sorry, if they have contrast allergies or if they have some type of like terrible like disease of their 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 um, kidneys, I probably wouldn't want to do a CT pulmonary angiogram, and I prefer a VQ scan. But in most cases, the CTPA is the preferred test. It'll basically help me to look at the pulmonary artery and say, oh, there she blow. There's this death clot that I can see here. Whereas a VQ scan, it can help me to see potentially areas of perfusion defects by these web-shaped kind of markings you see here. Here's the ventilation, here's the perfusion, and you can see in these particular areas, there's no perfusion that's going to these particular areas. So that could also help me to diagnose APE.
With that being said, if it does not show a PE on the P, uh, the CTPA or the VQ scan, I've excluded a PE. But if I do see a PE, then I have to ask myself the question. Is there a submassive or low risk PE or a massive PE? How the heck do I determine that? All right, get the echocardiogram. If the echocardiogram does not show any RV dilation or RV dysfunction, it is a low risk PE. If it does show RV dilation or RV dysfunction, it is a submassive or massive PE. And you're gonna look here, you're gonna see this right heart. Look how big and dilated this is. The right ventricle should not be bigger than the left ventricle over here. So that's definitely RV dysfunction. Then I ask myself the question, is the BP low? If the BP is low, that means that this is really a patient who's really bad and they have a massive PE burden. And if it's normal, then it's a submassive PE. This is the ways that I want you guys to think about how do we diagnose a PE. All right, I know this was a lot. So now what I wanna do is I wanna say, okay, let's treat a patient who has a pulmonary embolism because it's gonna kind of bring all these things together. Well, the first thing is I have to ask the question, are they hemodynamically unstable? Because if they are not hemodynamically unstable, is it a low risk or a submassive PE? And it's both of those. It would be a low risk or submassive PE. The difference is that a submassive PE has RV dysfunction, low risk PE has no RV dysfunction. All right, and the only way I'd be able to diagnose if they have a PE is a CT pulmonary angiogram or a VQ scan. If they have a high probability, I go straight to that. If they have a moderate probability with a D-dimer greater than 500, I go to that. If they have low probability, PERC score can't rule them out, D-dimer greater than 500, I go to this scan. Either way, I've gotten to the point where I say, okay, I got a submassive PE, RV dysfunction, normal blood pressure, low risk PE, no RV dysfunction, normal blood pressure. What do I do? Well, I ask myself the question, do they have a contraindication to anticoagulation? If there is no contraindication, give them anticoagulation. Warfarin, heparin, Xarelto, apixaban, I'm putting them on some type of anticoagulant. If they do, I cannot safely give them anticoagulation. I got to put an IVC filter in to prevent further DVTs from popping off and going up to the pulmonary artery. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then they have what's called a massive PE. Their blood pressure is low. They have RV dysfunction. And I found that off the CTPA likely as the biggest one. I asked myself the question, do they have a contraindication to TPA? If they do not, give them TPA. And if they do, then you have to go in and do an embolectomy. And that is the way that we would go in and diagnose a patient and treat a patient with a pulmonary embolism. All right, my friends, the next step here is how do we prevent the venous thromboembolism? Well, in patients who have this potential risk, it's obviously treating their underlying cause, right? But I think one of the biggest things is that if a patient's in the hospital, I think you need to have pharmacological prevention, especially in patients who are hospitalized, they're immobile, they're at their bed rest. They have an increased risk of venous stasis and conformal DVT. So oftentimes we do what's called low molecular weight heparin or subcutaneous heparin. And this is usually gonna be something that we will perform on a patient. Again, we do this if they have no contraindication to this and they're hospitalized, they're immobile, and they're on bed rest. If a patient is immobile on bed rest and we cannot safely give them these anticoagulate kind of molecules here, like low molecular weight heparin or subcutaneous heparin, then we'll do these things, these little devices, these sleeves that we put on their leg, and it'll intermittently kind of apply pneumatic compression to squeeze the actual legs and squeeze the veins to continue to keep moving and mobilizing blood. And that's the big ways that we would actually go through understanding venothromboembolism. Ninjas, I hope this made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. Thank you.